Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ask Concussion Doc. Today, I have a special guest. Dr. Adit Margaliot is a Canadian-trained neurologist with a fellowship in neuromuscular disorders and further specialization in sleep medicine. She has practiced in both hospital and community settings. She now practices functional medicine uh, with an approach to treating individuals as a whole and addressing the root cause of chronic illness. She views sleep as a very important component of an individual's care and also recognizes the impact of other health issues and their impact on sleep. She presently practices in Toronto and serves on the medical advisory board for complete concussion management. And today she is going to be joining me to speak all about her specialty, which is sleep and neurological conditions being uh, concussion. So Adit, thank you for joining me today. My pleasure, Cam. Always, always good to talk to you. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so we're going to kind of dive in the way that I've, I've framed this out is talking first about just kind of the function overall of sleep, the function, the purpose that it serves to us biologically, the benefits of sleep and getting good quality sleep, and then kind of go into concussion and how concussion can impact that. Um, now, I know sleep is obviously a super broad topic, but maybe we can just start off with the function of sleep and the kind of main biological purposes, um, you know, with respect to even inflammation and, and, and things like that. So I'll hand it over to you. What okay. is the function of sleep? Well, the bumper sticker uh, answer is we don't totally know. And there's lots we don't know. So that's really the bottom line. Now I can walk away. You're done. Um, but realistically, <laughs> we know. Yeah, that's right. Bye bye. Um, but we know a lot of things that do happen or go wrong if you don't sleep properly. And so um, if we talk about that and I'll kind of uh, uh, explain it, maybe in the way that I usually explain to patients, you know, it's not just a, a downtime of non-existence where, you know, you evolve to, to sleep so you wouldn't have to worry about uh, about uh, anything else. There's a lot that actually happens physiologically. Um, one of the key parts that got me involved in sleep was from uh, obviously the, the, the brain perspective. And what we've learned over the last few years is that during sleep, the brain cleans itself out. It flushes out toxins, it flushes out proteins that don't need to stay there because in fact, when we see an excessive buildup of some of these uh, components, what we, we see is the, is the typical pattern of an Alzheimer brain. Mm. Uh, so things like amyloid protein and, uh, you know, initially the data showed that when you're in the slow wave of sleep is when this flushing out happens. And in fact, the, the anatomy that allows that flushing to happen was only recognized a few years ago. Um, more recently, I think I just read a paper in the past week that suggests that in fact, it's the rhythmic breathing pattern that contributes to uh, good flushing out of the brain so that it's not even, you know, I used to say to patients, I think, you know, your sleep apnea or your other sleep disturbance is interfering with some of that slow wave sleep and, and maybe that's the process, but now we recognize it really is about the, the rhythmicity or the lack of it uh, in, in that disordered breathing that may be causing a problem. Um, there's, there's a lot of literature around the connection between sleep complaints and subsequent neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And, you know, this, the discussion is still there around chicken or the egg. You know, do we see it as, as just a part of the disease because whatever process caused your Parkinson's or your Alzheimer's um, is also impacting the parts of the brain that control sleep, or is it, you know, vice versa? And we see these these sleep disturbances years beforehand, and it's the lack of of, of good sleep and restorative sleep that contributes to your illness. Um, and that's that's definitely being looked at, and is unclear. But we do see um, certain even unique patterns of of sleep abnormalities years before certain conditions. Uh, as an example, Parkinson's disease. Even ten years out, you can see what we call uh, REM sleep behavior disorder, where uh, people act out often violently in sleep, and that's not a normal normal pattern. Um, so it's telling us something's happening years before we recognize the disease uh, process itself. Um, so we know that sleep allows the brain to clean itself out of toxins. We know that typically heart rate and blood pressure go down to some degree while you sleep is a bit of a restive period. Um, so those with disturbed sleep patterns don't achieve that. And we see that over time, there's sort of a persistence, even in daytime of elevated blood pressures, um, and, and 
cardiovascular disease. We know that good breathing patterns are important because if you have drops in oxygen levels while you sleep, for example, like in sleep apnea, that becomes uh, a trigger for inflammation. You get oxidative species and that can cause damage everywhere. I mean, I think, you know, in certain circles, one would now say that all chronic diseases are due to chronic inflammation. So uh, oxygen, good breathing, and therefore the, uh, what happens in sleep is, is very important as well. We know that um, there's uh, certain hormones that get released at night. So the, the most obvious one being growth hormone, uh, and that's particularly important in, in, in children to, to progress through puberty, but it's a hormone that's important throughout life um, to maintain uh, homeostasis in terms of muscle and bone and, and all sorts of things like that. So the reality is that um, sleep is sort of an overarching element that further impacts um, how, how diet and exercise and other aspects of lifestyle impact your, your health and well-being. We know that um, behaviorally and cognitively, if you don't sleep enough, you're more emotionally labile. So your boss is going to annoy you even that much more. So, <laughs> so the kids. Um, but cognitively, you, you don't have the same attention span. You don't have the ability to multitask, if you will. Um, reflexes are affected. So you can take an otherwise very healthy young person and deprive them of sleep for, well, experiments have been done. If you deprive them completely of sleep for just a few nights, you, you can in some cases cause even uh, in extreme cases, psychotic breaks, but on a, on a, a lesser degree, obviously you're going to contribute to car accidents. You're going to contribute to, um, uh, lots of learning difficulties. So we know that that sleep is required for memory consolidation and the ability to learn the next day. Um, so I tell anybody who's still at that stage of life, you know, if they're studying, please don't pull all nighters. I don't, you know, just, just, just don't do it. You're, you're, you're really shooting yourself in the foot, both from what you learned yesterday, what you learned right before sleep and your ability to do anything with it the next day. So, so, you know, you're talking about cardiovascular health. You're talking about brain health. You're talking about next day brain function. You're talking about emotional function. It hits everything. And of course, what I hadn't even said is, and people I think naturally recognize this when you have slept poorly, it impacts how you eat the next day and what your food choices are. And so all of those hormones, your leptin and your ghrelin, th those are impacted. And there are also, um, if you will, it's not sleep patterns, but circadian patterns in uh, other organs other than your brain, even your gut, even the, the microbiome. And so um, all of that is tied into sort of a, a cyclical pattern of being awake and resting and sleeping there that's the very long-winded version of we don't know <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh it, i mean there's obviously a lot to unpack with that because it touches on so many areas the system you were talking about that was that was just discovered in terms of clearing that inflammation is that the glymphatic system is that yeah yeah so it's so so you know we learned about that um you know just a few years ago now they're recognizing even uh the importance of seeing perivascular spaces around blood vessels on scans uh in, in people and what that might mean so it's amazing that we're still learning about the anatomy of the brain uh, as well as its ongoing function mm -hmm. the the other thing that was interesting there um that i'd never heard before is that rhythmic breathing process could mm -hmm. is that also um evidence of um, altered breathing patterns in wakefulness potentially being contributing to stress, inflammation, again, chicken or the egg, are we breathing abnormally because we're stressed or are we stressed because we're breathing abnormally? Um, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's a beautiful question. I think the studies would still have to be done on that, but I think in the, you know, sphere where people work on rest and relaxation through breathing techniques, um, we, we typically look at that as an impact on your vagal system, your autonomic system, but who knows how much of that is then leading back to the impact um, on the brain in terms of the flushing. Um, the flushing tends to happen while you sleep, less so during the day, so it might not be due to that pattern uh, or due to that mechanism, but it no doubt has impact on your brain. Now, the buildup um, of adenosine, I think is what you were kind of referring to as being 
Is that, is that what we're talking about with the buildup of certain compounds? No, no. no. So adenosine is a, is, a, is a compound that you naturally secrete and it builds up the longer you're awake, the greater the buildup of that. So when I was talking about buildup of certain proteins, we're talking it, it impacting your risk of Alzheimer's. I'm talking about actually amyloid protein. So this is a, a, a misfolded protein that we see in Alzheimer brains and, and uh, is part of the diagnostic pathology of it. It shouldn't be there. And there, there is some controversy in the literature about what it might mean. Um, is that in fact the pathology? So having it in the brain is causing, you know, it, it shouldn't be there. It's pushing on things, it's irritating things and therefore causing the brain to malfunction. Some people might say, no, it's just a byproduct of inflammation in the brain and isn't the direct issue itself because you can see people with cognitive issues that don't have it and vice versa. It's not a direct one-to-one. And so when we, uh, when they've done studies and looked at people uh, sleeping normally, flushing the brain out normally versus not sleeping well and not flushing out uh, properly, we can see some of these amyloid type proteins building up. Interesting, because I know that even, um, you know, things like alcohol, like alcohol is obviously related to Alzheimer's and cognitive issues as well. And alcohol obviously significantly impacts sleep. So you know, you start thinking, okay, is this a, is this a reflection of the inflammation itself the out, that alcohol causes, or is this because of the sleep difficulty? Like, you know what I mean? You can go. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you don't see the same pathological changes in a, in a typically in a, in a purely, um, uh, in a brain that's been uh, exposed to a lot of alcohol and that you might say that was, that was the cause of, of uh, death or other health implications. Um, you, you, you really do impact, I mean, alcohol is, is the toxin to your liver and to other things. And so you can actually see shrinkage in the brain from alcohol exposure. You can get nutritional deficits that then lead to, to brain dysfunction. Um, but I think it's a fair point where, um, yes, absolutely. When you drink alcohol and, and unfortunately, sometimes people use it as a, as a de-stressing mechanism and, and to get you to sleep, it's a little bit of inducing a sort of a coma like response, but not true sleep and the metabolites of alcohol, um, fragment sleep and therefore cause you to, uh, come out of deep sleep, to break up your sleep, to stay in lighter sleep. And, and so that in and of itself is going to have an impact. You're right. So it's very, it's a, it's a very complex system when you, when you use too much alcohol. It's, um, it's one of those things because I've been tracking my sleep for, for a few years now, with just a, just a basic aura ring. Um, and you notice it right away. It's like, it's a Friday night, you have a couple glasses of wine and my sleep is just crap. Like my, and my, all my readiness scores go down. My heart rate variability goes to crap. And it's just, it's amazing. It's like, I had like two drinks, like, come on. And yeah. it destroys your, your sleep. So it's, a, it's an unfortunate uh, thing. I, I feel um. it, it is. <laughs> and you know, everyone might find that their threshold for that disturbance is, is different. Um, but it's, it's inevitable. I think people who do use those kind of trackers inevitably would say, I definitely see a worsening after alcohol. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And that's, that's been the interesting thing uh, and just tracking it. And I think that's been something that's been eye opening for me, things that we can do during the day. And we'll talk about some of the things you can do to optimize your sleep during the day. But um, I found that just by altering when I eat certain foods or what type of foods I eat or whatever, I can really like optimize things where it's like, I've always been a person that's been, yeah, I sleep fine. I get my eight hours of sleep and that's fine. But when you actually start looking at the quality of that sleep and realizing that how much it is impacted by the smallest little things throughout your day. Uh, and you can start actually, you know, kind of quote biohacking that in a way to optimize it and how much better you feel, you know, the next yeah. day you're like, Oh my God, like it's, it's just incredible. You slept the same amount of time, but it was really, really good quality, deep sleep. And um, you know, I think there's, there's something to be, to be said there. Cause I think a lot of people just assume, yeah, I sleep fine. I get my eight hours, but they don't realize that they're not actually really sleeping well, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, I think, you know, um, before I got into the, into the sleep world, I basically realized there were two people, one who complained about their sleep and one were, who were putting up with their sleep. It was very, very rare to see anyone who really had good quality. Yes. I feel refreshed and I get the hours. I, I think there's a lot of misconceptions, uh, that have evolved over time about what is a normal amount of sleep that that's a, a little bit of uh, demystifying that I do in my clinic. But I think one of, uh, the other big misconceptions is just, as you just, uh, touched on is how much food and everything else you do during the day impacts your sleep. So the timing of eating and what you eat relative to those hours, you know, everybody 
will tell me, yeah, yeah, I know all about sleep hygiene. You know, I really, really, really try not to use my phone for more than an hour right before bed. And then I'll do some work and then I'll, you know, it's things like that, but they don't realize all of that, uh, all the rest of it. So I hope we talk about that a little bit. I was going to say that's actually possibly one of the components that alcohol uh, contributes to the disturbance of sleep. So it's not just about the alcohol itself, but also the sugar content. Right. right. So, so yeah, that'll come up with, uh, with eating. Yeah. 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 Or even things like morning exposure to light and, and, and that type of stuff. I've noticed a major difference if I, you know, don't get outside right away or, or have that, you know, early light exposure that it actually will affect your sleep that night. Um, so it's, it's things people wouldn't even really consider. Right. Um, yeah. So let's, let's kind of switch gears into concussion and then we'll come back to some of those things that can, you know, improve or disturb, um, sleep. Now, how does, how does concussion affect sleep? So again, in a very, very multifactorial sort of way. So we can look at it. What are the things that might happen within the brain as a result of the trauma itself? And then there's the more sort of what's happening to the rest of the person that's then contributing. So maybe I'll start with the person because this is the one that maybe people recognize the most. So when you do things like, first of all, they've got symptoms, so now they can no longer work. And what, and, and, and sometimes they were told, well, you gotta go rest, you gotta stay in a dark room, you gotta do less. So what happens is they completely change their schedule um, they no longer have to be anywhere. So they start sort of free sleeping. So free scheduling their sleep, you know, go to bed when you want to wake up when you want to sleep during the day when you want to. And so that disrupts it. They don't feel well enough to do things like exercise and potentially eat well or shop depending on their, their life circumstances. Um, and so, uh, there's that element and then body pain or other pains can disrupt their sleep when it's there. Uh, life has been, completely shot to hell. So now they're also depressed about all of that and, and mood will affect sleep as well as vice versa. Um, and so all of those things impact it and the medications that we might use for for pain or other or other things can, can impact sleep um, as well as other parts of the body that, that impact. Um, if we look directly at what happens in the brain, and I think we have a lot more to, to learn and research about that, um, it's a lot. So um, you can see disruption in hormones and that may be due to directly, you know, with, with the impact, you may hit the pituitary gland where a lot of these hormones are originating from, or it's an important part of the pathway actually hit a bony component of the skull. And so that causes disruption because the area has been inflamed. We can see on, and, and I guess I'm, I, we're mostly talking about concussions to mild, mild injuries, not, not the, the massive ones with, with bleeding and so forth, but nonetheless, you get some, um, some micro bleed, some chemical changes in how the neurons function, and you might even have a breakdown of the blood brain barrier. And so certain things might leak into the brain that shouldn't be there. So really what you've done is you've, you've triggered an inflammatory response. And that is, probably in essence why we can see patients actually get worse over time it's not just necessarily the bad habits that they get into but because it's a a, a poorly uh, responsive pathway was initially you know set up to to try to fight this this acute issue but now you've got perpetuated inflammation uh, that continues and so you can get changes in gene regulating proteins and and how the neurons function and and so you can see some uh even if it's not structural on an mri you get some changes in how the neurons function chemically and hormonally yeah another uh <laughs> large can of worms to unpack right. um the other thing that's 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 interesting is uh just going back to kind of the breathing pattern thing is that after concussion we see changes in breathing patterns we see a lot um shallower breathing patterns that tend to happen we tend to see changes and shifts in the autonomic nervous system towards kind of more of a sympathetic dominance um which can alter kind of breathing rates um and that's been associated with like cardiovascular like heart rate variability type you know fluctuations um, and also differences in, in blood oxygen levels um, yeah, after injury. So it's interesting on the sleep side, if we have an altered breathing pattern, you know, could that be impacting our sleep or even our ability to, to clear inflammation? Um, I think that's, that's something that's, that's interesting. Um, then on the, uh, on the, um, on, on the other side, just going back to the person side, um, 
another thing that people do is they become light sensitive, right? So they tend to avoid exposure to light, which then affects circadian rhythms. Can you kind of speak a little bit to the circadian rhythms and how that is important to have that proper, right? Free sleeping you mentioned, but also just exposure to light, being told to sit in a dark room and how that can be actually detrimental. Yeah. Luckily, I think we're seeing less of that recommendation. And so in an otherwise healthy person, um, light exposure is actually incredibly important to set your circadian clock. So we we understand that we we function on sort of a 24 hour pattern. Um, the reality is that the, the, the brain centers that regulate, you know, what's going to happen and how things change throughout that cycle actually work on a slightly longer um, time uh, length, a little bit more than 24 hours. And so what happens to make sure that we are in fact doing something at the same time each day physiologically is that light exposure in the morning. It kind of sets your clock and says, ah, this is start time. Uh, and amongst other things, it's gonna say, so in about 12 to 16 hours, you're gonna to wanna, to, you're gonna feel sleepy and you're gonna to start to wanna to go to sleep. And that's in conjunction with that ADP buildup or adenosine buildup, pardon me, and, and melatonin. But light exposure in the morning is a really important trigger for setting you up for a good sleep that night. And so um, you might, you know, you found that that ensuring that you get that is so important. But part of the problem is, as you said, um, concussion patients, again, they might vary their 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 sleep time. So they might wake up later and be exposed to that light later. And also because they're photosensitive, they might be wearing sunglasses and avoiding bright lights because that may trigger headaches and so forth. And so they're not getting that entrainment. And you know, that's fair enough. If it's painful, you don't necessarily want to go to that a degree, but I tell my patients do it for as much as you can. But the most important thing is keep it to a regular schedule and make sure you're getting that exposure earlier in the day. Because the problem is that the later you expose yourself to that bright light, the later you're pushing your bedtime. You know, your body's learning. It's kind of like, you know, traveling uh, through time zones. So now if wake up time and sun is exposures at 11 a.m., you're not going to feel tired by 10 p.m. You're going to be up well into the night. And so that in and of itself can shift things and then have people get thrown off and, and, and further off the kind of sleep schedule that they, they ideally should have. There was, there was a study that was done um, uh, recently. I, I'm, I know that you're probably familiar with this one, but looking at concussion patients, and they randomized them. So it was an RCT. They randomized them to do um, like early blue light exposure versus amber light uh, for, I think it was 30 minutes uh, or within 30 minutes of waking. And I think they did it for 30 minutes as well. Um, and it was just like an artificial light, which I think, you know, direct sunlight would be better. But anyway, and they found that the blue light group was actually phase shifting their their sleep much better than the than the amber group so they were able to get actually i think an extra hour of sleep um on average versus the amber light group which which didn't have that so um i mean that was like a that was a huge light bulb for me um and just you know learning about how that that cycle is so important to to, to your sleep and then on the on the other side there's like a window in which, you know, you need to go to bed. And like, I learned that just through my, through my aura ring um, of saying, cause it it'll tell you your optimal bedtime is between this time and this time. And it, I found that if we hit that window, like if we hit our sleep window, like I'm out like a light ready to go. If I miss that by even five or 10 minutes, I'm tossing and turning. I thought you were going to say you learned that from having young children, um, because I think we recognize that, you know, you, you, you miss their window and you've got a, a, a meltdown on your hands. But we're we're in fact the same way. We need that consistency. And that's because so many components of our physiology follow that circadian rhythm. They have a set clock. They do it based on light exposure. We can mess with that quite a bit by what we expose it to, but they do work on clocks. And so there's an optimal time for everything. And part of that is the consistency and patterning, but a part of that is also light or lack thereof, but absolutely. And, and the one thing that I liked about the, the study that you talked about in terms of that morning light exposure, um, is that they also showed improved synaptic connection. So improved communication within the brain as a result of that. Now, whether that's a direct result of light or a result of better sleep, you can't tease that out. But the fact that not only was your sleep better, but things were happening in the brain that were healthy, um, it was wonderful to see. I, I always tell patients, look, um, bright sunlight 
um, exposes you to a far greater, brighter, stronger um, input or stimulus than, you know, light within your house. But if you don't have that opportunity, then yes, I, I use the light box as well. It was on just, you know, until a little while ago. Go ahead, turn all, on the lights in your house and your computer screens. That's the time to use it. And that's actually sometimes why I see patients who don't have a, a head injury or any other concerns, but they were sold on blue light filtering glasses. Right. And they wear that right. all the time. And I'm like, no, don't do right. that. You want that in the morning. You, you need that. Right. And I think, well, let's talk about that then because after concussion i feel like it's almost just the standard go-to of every optometrist to throw a blue filter in these glasses and i think it's counterintuitive when you're dealing with a concussion to i mean i can see it if it's helpful for you during certain times like using the computer or whatever but their everyday walking around glasses are filtering out all the blue light uh and so you don't recommend I don't recommend it. Um, obviously, if you're so sensitive that it, you're, you're, you're sensitive 24 seven and you can't handle it, uh, even then I would say, look, um, use them selectively so we have an opportunity to introduce some of that blue light and brighter light where we can. Uh, so don't invest in glasses now because you know unless you're replacing them in the next few months and it's gonna be something you have for years, it's, it's not a good thing. Um, so we need that uh, brighter light and we need that blue light to help and train our circadian uh, a clock. So um, there has to be a reason and maybe just a timeliness to it. Use it in the situations where you really need to. Well, I feel it's almost like a, it's kind of a catch 22 is that, um, you know, I can't expose myself to blue light because it it's symptom provoking, but by not exposing yourself to blue light, you're messing with your sleep and circadian rhythm and, and your ability to clear inflammation. And then the more inflammation you have, which then, you know, there's gut brain access, there's issues with digestion, you're getting more inflammation and you're not sleeping as well. So you're not clearing it. And then the inflammation can, you know, in, increase the kind of hyper excitability of the nervous system, which makes you more sensitive to light. So, you know what I mean? Like it kind of goes yeah. in this, in this yeah. cycle where it's just a vicious thing that we kind of have to stop it somewhere. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you there. Um, how do we get people to, um, you know, stop doing that or do it selectively? Um, I think it's an education. I think it's an understanding where, you know, perhaps they were told, well, just avoid the blue light because it causes symptoms, avoid everything that causes you discomfort, which is certainly how we approached it, right? Anything that causes symptoms, you've got to stop. And, and to some degree, we do that from a, a, an exercise point of view. But if we teach them why it's important and say, so let's increase and, and expose you to as much as you can tolerate. And over time, hopefully that will build. But um, I think education around, you know, total uh, lack of exposure is the way to go um, was not helpful for sure. Right. And OK, so let's let's go into certain uh, pathologies, particularly sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's been a handful of studies that have found increased prevalence of sleep apnea. I don't know if you've come across this in your practice following concussion injuries, but um, I've seen ah. newly diagnosed sleep apnea, um, you know, whether that whether concussion was the catalyst or not, it's hard to tell in an individual patient, but it seems uh, based on the literature that there's this uptick in, in sleep apnea. Can you trace that into any kind of pathological mechanism or any, any physiologic issue that you could see kind of driving that? So it's a great question because, yeah, the data does suggest uh, population wise that we do see this increased rate among, among people who've had concussions. Um, but interestingly, we, we're looking at obstructive, not central apnea, where central apnea is different than obstructive. And I'll just briefly explain central is where the brain just doesn't send the signal to the body to take a breath. Whereas in obstructive apnea, the brain sends the signal, but the airway has collapsed and has mm. closed and therefore you cannot draw the, well, I should draw down uh, the air. And so um, we don't necessarily have a good explanation why an obstructive uh, mechanism would be more prevalent. Having said that, some of the risk factors that go along with developing obstructive sleep apnea tends to occur. So uh, uh, gaining weight uh, is a risk factor for sleep apnea. And again, the lack of exercise, you know, eating more, your sleep has already been disrupted. It's all setting you up for weight gain. So that can contribute. Sometimes medications uh, may contribute, though typically a little bit to weight gain, but also to breathing, but though that's typically um, seen with central apnea. And then there's simply a question of whether, you know, at the end of the day, it's still um, 
neural pathways that control the pattern of breathing, the maintenance of tone and muscles. So have we disrupted um, that pathway in some way, whether directly through impact or the subsequent inflammation that is happening in the brain? So just, just to clarify, what we're seeing with these patients is obstructive apnea, not central? Correct. Okay. Wow, yeah. that's, that's interesting. Do you think there's, there's an inflammatory mechanism there? Like, you, you like weight gain, obviously, um, but, you know, just could, could inflammation, like, could there be some gut dysregulation or dysbiosis or something that's creating increased inflammation, which is just making things a little more swollen or? So that's a really interesting question. Um, and I don't know whether I could, I could take it to that level, but I would say certainly, uh, the weight gain and in, in obstructive sleep apnea, I mean, everybody worries about the, you know, around their waist, but we're looking at the weight literally around the neck that's pushing down on the airway and therefore more likely to make it collapse. But also even when you're, you're depositing adipose uh, cells and, and, and depositing fat, the, the body sort of does it everywhere. And that includes the, the fat cells in your neck. So you're actually narrowing the airway a little bit. Um, so, so there's that mechanical component. Um, and then whether the inflammation uh, that you're talking about within the brain or elsewhere just leading to nerve dysfunction so that the pathways that regulate the, the tone are just not functioning quite as well as they should be. Mm. It's, it's possible, but I don't have data around that. Yeah, because we see, I mean, we see similar things where people with concussion injuries have um, like decreased cervical muscle tone, you know, in their neck. So, um, you know, altered firing patterns of, of different neurons. We've even seen uh, like low back changes in low back firing pro, um, um, just muscle patterning. Um, so so that might speak to that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. That is interesting. Well, that, that's generally fairly temporary though. Um, and then I also have seen, I've seen a couple of patients that have had onset of sleep apnea and they're still, they're fairly thin. Like they're not, you know, overweight people necessarily. You wouldn't necessarily classify them as obese in any way. And we see that in the non-concussed population as well, uh, not as commonly in our in our population, but there are certain facial airway structures that are just predisposed to it a little bit. If you've already got a narrower uh, airway to start with and narrower opening, uh, it takes less to push you over the edge. Mm. And would the, you know, the go-to would be a CPAP, but is there other stuff you recommend to patients? So, so the go-to, first of all, is to do a sleep study to, yeah. to find out what you have and then to address it. And then it does depend on the severity and what other mod modifiable uh, factors you may have. So in certain people, I mean, you occasionally see somebody with just massive tonsils that are, are obstructing them during the day. And so removing that may be helpful. It's generally not the way we go with, with uh, most of uh, uh, sleep apnea patients these days. In, in again, select patients, uh, jaw surgery to reposition may even be helpful. Those are the more extreme versions. For the most part, it's 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 sleep uh, CPAP is is a easier way to go because it's it's uh, non invasive and it's very effective. So depending on the severity, if you're severe or even moderately severe, um, that really is the best way to go. But if you're in the more mild side, we do we do look at things like a dental appliance that you can wear at night where it thrusts your lower jaw forward, it kind of opens up the back of your mouth, which is really part of the airway, try to widening it, widen it a bit more so that air can actually get through when things collapse. And in some patients, it's as simple as keeping them off their back. They might have pretty significant apnea on their back and pretty insignificant uh, to no apnea on their on their side, we just keep them on their their side. We we recommend things like positional belts. Mm. Um, so something as, as simple as that. Mm. Is, is there any exercises that people can do like so know, it's a good question yeah yeah it's a good question and there is a i think there's maybe one actual study that's been done um but there are exercises called uh uh, uh my functional therapy exercises um where the therapist will work with the patient on strengthening some of those muscles in the oropharynx um, they might also look at you know uh, what's your tongue positioning are you doing everything that you can to sort of maximize the tone i mean in the states they've actually in some cases started to use uh, nerve stimulators uh to to um uh, basically bring tone back to some of the, the structures in in the back of the mouth to keep them from flopping and blocking the airway um, seems significant we're not doing that in canada at the moment <laughs> um but 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 people are looking and in terms of um and again some of the 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 things that we can talk about with patients again depending on where things are at is 
um, breathing through your nose has an impact on apnea. Uh, and you probably know this just from your own interest, I'm sure. Um, breathing through your mouth makes it worse. So it's unlikely that you know, it's giving you significant apnea. And if you just started breathing through your nose, severe apnea is going to go away, but it does alter things. So it's always worth addressing if you're not breathing through your, mo- your nose, why not? And can we do something about it? Do you, do you recommend mouth taping to your patients? I do. I do. Uh, if they can, in fact, breathe through their nose and it's more uh, habitual than anything else, the ones that are all stuffed up, I'm not going to do that to them. No. Yeah. 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 Like, I mean, I, I haven't tried it yet, but I've obviously seen um, a lot about it and, you know, have, I'm curious about it because when you're sleeping, you don't know, am I breathing through my mouth? Am I breathing through my nose? Um, I guess I, I could always ask my wife <laughs> if she rolls over and sees if I'm, you know, mouth wide open or not, but. But you um, want to let her sleep. She doesn't want to be yeah, tracking yeah, ex- you. Yeah, exactly. Well, she's got to get up with the kids all the time anyway for bathroom uh, breaks and everything else. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm just interested. Do you do that personally? I don't um, because I've, I have not, you know, sometimes people who do breathe through their mouth will wake up with a dry mouth. They may have some dental issues. There's some um, some hints that way that you might be uh, breathing orally. Um, and I don't have that for people who do. I do recommend it. Um, and, and certainly if you're snoring as well, if there's a bit of a complaint there, that's a good place to start. Um, but for those who want to experiment, it's a, it's a, it's a low risk experiment, get some medical tape and put, you know, a couple of vertical strips and see how the night goes and see if that makes any difference. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, okay. So let's, let's go into optimizing sleep. I mean, we'll assume that most patients are not going to end up with sleep apnea, but I wanted to cover that for those that do, because it does seem to be, you know, increased prevalence after concussion injury. So those that are looking to optimize their sleep after concussion, what are your kind of go-to strategies to kind of get things rolling? Well, truly they'd be the same recommendation I would give to everyone and anyone. Um, And so as you alluded to, what you do right from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed can have an impact. So, teaching 101 is keep your rise time consistent ideally your bedtime but if you can't do that the time you wake up every morning please please keep that consistent again just because it tells your brain and every other part of your body what it's supposed to do at any given time and ideally you want to do it at a time where you're going to be able to get some daylight sun exposure uh, early on so within the first half hour so so I don't necessarily recommend waking up at 10, 11, 12. Uh, Ideally, in fact, keep the same pattern that you would have based on your lifestyle before you got the concussion. So if you got up at a certain time for work, unless it's especially early, but let's say something like a seven o'clock or an eight o'clock, you go out and you get some bright sunshine. And that's both from a light exposure perspective, but just we know that being outside, preferably nature, will downregulate your your stress response. So if you can find a park, that already is addressing things. And that's, again, important from a sleep perspective because we wanna do things through the day to reduce cortisol and reduce stress responses. Um, so the light exposure is there, ideally sunshine, if you cannot get that, then use your 10,000 lux minimum happy lamp um, and, and whatever electronics and things you have. If you don't have yours, I have mine. I can get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I have it here somewhere. Do, mine, mine is covered in sticky notes, so I better not pull it into the screenshot. Um, but, uh, and, and these can be, I mean, I bought mine at Costco. You just want to make sure, you know, it's, it's not a low light. It's a 10,000 lux light. You put it about 40. There you go, beauty. You put it at about arm length away from your face, aimed at about 45 degree angle. So it's not directly into your eyeballs, but it's off to, and, and, and the light that I'm getting right now, it's through the window, but that's about the angle that I usually get. Um, and so ideally a good half hour, more is definitely fine. You know, I have mine going throughout the morning when I'm working at my desk. Um, then, you know what, people do love their coffee and their caffeinated drinks. And I know that Probably many people know, okay, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, um, finish your coffee by 12 p.m. And that's because of how long the half-life may be to break down that caffeine. And the impact of caffeine is to suppress your brain's recognition of sleeping signals and then your ability to stay in in deep restorative sleep. So it it messes with your ability to find that good window, um, uh, as you said. The other aspect that for some people is is equally as important and therefore the timing is is um, still problematic to have it in the morning is it can raise your stress response. 
And if you do that throughout the day frequently enough and depending where your threshold already is, which is probably a lot higher after a concussion, it might be pushing you too far and that might still be impacting you at bedtime and, and during the night. So there's a bit of a longer acting mechanism there. Um, if you're able to exercise in general, we say good, uh, whatever you can do, do, but ideally you would do it in the morning so that the impact of it, you know, by doing it later in the evening isn't there because what can happen if you do it, for example, at night is uh, it raises core body temperature and it raises your stress response again. I mean, it's a normal, that's what you want to see happen. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's how the body gets stronger, but you don't want that happening in the hours before bed. Um, and so because I touched on the, the matter of temperature, I'm going to skip a little bit to that. You want your body temperature to be cool at night. Okay. And that's why you want your bedroom to be cool and you don't want to be piled up with heavy clothing or, or blankets. Your, your core body temperature has to go down uh, a, a bit. And if you're too warm, you'll wake up and, and we've all had that experience. So whatever you can do and need to do to ensure that is, is, is important. So, um, the material of your mattress, your bedding, your your thermostat at home. Um, for some people, having a, a hot shower at night is good because actually what it does is it vasodilates you and then allows more hair, more more, more hot uh, or heat to dissipate, and so you are in fact cooler. But this is also where eating comes in. So we can talk about the impact of what you know alcohol has, or or even the sugar contact. The content of your of your meals in the hours before bed, but the 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 way it impacts temperature is very simple. When your body is looking to digest food, and by the way, it'll do it very inefficiently at night because that's not what it's supposed to be doing. Then, um, it shunts blood to the core because it's going to absorb nutrients from your gut, so the blood goes there. And just by doing that, it raises your body temperature, and so you're more likely to wake up or have interrupted sleep. Okay. Um, so then we can we can start to look at um, what is, is so well what can happen in middle to uh, later in the day in concussion patients and other patients is napping. Um, so obviously this has to be nuanced depending on where you are in your injury and your energy levels and so forth. But what can then become uh, habit forming and problematic is if you sleep during the day, you've now dissipated one of the uh, chemical signals that tells your brain to be tired and go to bed later that night. So basically that's the adenosine, it builds up through the day. The longer you've been awake, the higher the level goes, and then it becomes a stronger pressure to go to sleep. So if you um, have a nap during the afternoon, you've kind of let off that pressure and you're kind of starting again, there won't be the same strength of pressure to push you to go to bed at a good early bedtime. Um, and then it becomes about light exposure later in the day. So naturally, uh, everybody knows melatonin and that it signals our need to go to sleep as one of its functions. It starts to ramp up as we hit dusk. So as the light just gets less bright, as it starts to darken a little bit is when that change happens. And it tells the brain, you know, in about three to five hours is when you're going to want to go to sleep. Um, so the bright light exposure that we all do, because we're on our computers and we're driving and we're in front of TVs and we're doing, you know, we have all our lights on at home is we're completely negating that. So the, the rise in melatonin doesn't seem to happen if we do that. And so that's going to push your bedtime uh, later. And, uh, and, and continued exposure to bright, bright light will do that. Um, so often I talk to people about simply reducing the amount of light in their homes. You don't have to turn on all your bright lights. And of course, we've all switched to high efficiency LEDs. So they're nice blue lights, which is unfortunately a real downside. And so for those who might still have the yellow incandescent, use them, mm -hmm. you know, burn some candles. Just don't fall down the stairs and trip over the dog because you can't mm -hmm. see. Um, but feel free to use the blue light filtered glasses at that time. And at that point, the ones that I often see on people for computer use where it's just a tiny little sheen of blue, mm. that's not enough. You want to use the orange ones that really do a good job of blocking out as much of that blue green light as possible. So that's when you bring those out. Or if you wish, um, you know, use your sunglasses to, to mitigate the bright light exposure. Um, and then 
not use your electronics because that's an intense direct source of that bright blue light into your eyeballs. And that serves two functions. Um, one, the light, so the whole impact on circadian and melatonin secretion and so forth. But what are you usually doing on those screens? And if you're doing work, that is just too stimulating and, and um, cortisol provoking for most people, uh, even if they love their work, to be doing at night because you really need to send signals to your brain that it's safe to go to sleep. Um, and any excitement that you get from work related emails or whatever else is just too, too stimulating. So it serves two purposes there. Um, so reducing light exposure, really, I would say from eight o'clock on is pretty good, but as close as you can get to that, the better, uh, dim the lights, use your, your blockers, uh, minimize electronics, stop doing work if you can. Um, I, I know that's, uh, that's hard for many of us, but sometimes setting a limit is important in doing relaxing things um, and and very much ensuring that your bedroom once you're there is completely dark and as quiet as it can be and as cool as it can be. So the people who have their TVs on and some even going throughout the night, they can tell me, look, I, I, I don't look at it. I'm like, OK, but light still gets through the eye, eyelids um, and those little bits of exposure are just not healthy. You really need a, a dark, dark room. Um, don't put things that just by being aware of them, it triggers a, um, a dopamine stimulus and that's your phone. So just looking at it, you know, there's an association that's been created. Um, uh, and so leaving the, that out of the bedroom, the eating and drinking. So as we talked about the impact of alcohol, so really if you go to drink, I'm all for daytime drinking because from a sleep perspective, it's the worst. Um, but the recommendations are largely stop eating. And drinking anything other than water but we can come back to the water part about three hours before bedtime um and and um that is so that you're not still digesting food and not only shunting blood to the core and raising your core body temperature but fl causing fluctuations in your blood sugar that can also then cause changes in your insulin and that can cause you to wake up um so people might actually notice when they have sugary simple processed carbohydrates, they're more likely to wake up at night. I know that's true. Now, there's a little bit of a nuance there again, uh, perhaps even more so with women. Um, so, so, you know, when I work with patients, we have to work a little bit on biohacking and see what works. So sometimes a little bit of carbohydrate is, is actually helpful, but too much would be problematic. Um, so you don't want to be hungry when you go to bed. That's difficult and you don't want to have crashes during the night. So just hitting that sweet spot um, my experience is there's a bit of difference between men and women and again, individually, um, and, and, and even, um, fluid intake for some, they end up waking up to pee if they have too much fluid at night. So again, if you can kind of finish all of that by about three hours before bed, then you've probably processed what you've, you've needed to process. Um, so those are, those are sort of the, the, the big ones. Um, there's always if people having to look at specifically at what medications or supplements they're specifically taking in case they're alerting or excessively sedating at other times of the day and, 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 um, see what may be going on there. A couple questions. Um, the first one is just about light. Those that are like really intense on the sleep side will tell you to go around and actually tape off even little like led tiny lights that are being emitted from you know, let's say the box on your TV, you have a little red light on it, or even some light switches have a glow to them. They recommend yeah. you actually remove all of that light. Um, and do you, do you recommend that as well? I do for people who are sensitive, um, just to see if it makes a difference. Now, do I have studies that said that amount of light made this much difference? No, but for some people when they're quite sensitive, I would say, yeah. So even, uh, your phone being off, but charging will give mm -hmm. off a little light, uh, those little electronic bits that show the power is on. I would, I would do that, you mm -hmm. know, unless you're sleeping perfectly, that's one easy, easy thing to do. Uh, and then the other side, what, what else was going to ask? Um, I had another one that slipped my mind now. I'm sure it'll, it'll come back. At some so point. let me just add one thing that I, I, I wanted to mention and I didn't before. Um, and this is a common one because it used to be that the advice was given, you know, if you can't fall asleep at the beginning of the night, or let's say you wake up in the night, just stay in bed and hopefully eventually you'll fall back asleep. So you're already in bed and it's easier. Um, and, and that's really bad advice. <laughs> so what we would recommend is, is, is kind of the opposite because again, your, your brain is very Pavlovian and very trainable. And so when you stay in bed, 
unable to sleep and frustrated, you're training your brain to register that your bed or your bedroom environment is a place of not sleeping and a place of frustration. Mm. And for some people, the worry about not being able to sleep is, is just as damaging as anything else. Um, so you don't want to reinforce that connection of bed and not sleeping. Um, so if you are unable to fall asleep within, say, 15, 20 minutes, and that's at the beginning of the night or in the middle of the night, leave, go somewhere else, ideally go somewhere very dark and do something that does not involve shining any sort of light. So I'm a big fan of like pop in a, a podcast or, or something like that, but in a nice quiet place and only go into your bedroom again at the beginning of the night or in the middle of the night when you feel like you are ready to drop off like you are likely to just as soon as I put my head down I'm going to go out in like a minute or two and if you do that and you again do not fall asleep within 10 15 minutes at that point leave and start again so that you are not building that connection of not sleeping in your bed I find that it's like a um like a a cycle that gets to you when you have like let's say you have a night where you wake up and it's like two o'clock in the morning and then you just can't sleep and then you have that frustration and you know maybe eventually you fall asleep by like four or five the next night you'll wake up at two again and you'll and immediately you go oh no oh no oh no i can't do this again and now you're awake and then it's like once you're in that cycle it's very hard because of the stress response you have as soon as you wake up whereas if you're sleeping well you wake up you roll over you just nod back off and you're done but i find it's in times of there's a lot going on, a lot of stress, whatever you get up and you start thinking, your mind starts thinking about things. And then you realize, oh my God, I'm not sleeping. And, oh, I'm going to be so tired tomorrow. And, but then for the next week, it just, you're stuck every, in that pattern. Yeah. It, yeah. Every time. So, um, so here, here's the recommendation for that. Assuming that you've done the other things well, relatively speaking, in terms of what you're eating and, and screen exposure and all of that is, is actually sleep restriction. Um, and that is a technique to try to just force your brain by only giving it a certain amount of time to sleep. Like you're going to have to sleep through because otherwise you won't have a chance. And so the idea behind that is this, um, and, and again, as long as you've had other issues disturbing your sleep ruled out, like you don't want to be doing this if you have untreated sleep apnea, you didn't know about, and that's why you were waking up. Um, but everything else being fine. Let's say, you know, your alarm is going to go off at seven. Usually you go to bed at 11. And so that gives you good eight hours sleep. But for these last couple of nights, you wake up at two and you'll lose two hours of sleep, which means now you're only getting uh, what I say, you're getting maybe uh, eight hours before. Now you're down to six and uh, and you're feeling tired. Well, guess what you're going to do? You're going to keep your alarm set at seven and you're only going to give yourself six hours to sleep in bed. You're only going to give yourself six hours in bed, period, which means you're not getting into bed until a couple of minutes before 1 a.m. Now, you're not going to do things to keep yourself awake, like drink coffee and stay on your electronics, things that are going to disrupt your circadian clock and everything like that. You're just sleep restricting so that by the time you get to bed, you're exhausted and you're so exhausted, your brain just going to crash right through. Mm. And now you've reestablished a pattern of hopefully sleeping through. Now with the next night, you might go and rather go at 1 a.m., you might go back just uh, 15 minutes earlier. Mm. Okay. Um, And make sure that you fall fast asleep and stay asleep. And then you just keep moving it back on a nightly basis until you're back to your normal uh, bedtime routine. I've had to redo that to myself a few Mm. times when I got into bad patterns and it works, you know, like it works fairly quickly. Often I need to do it for one night only. Right. Um, that seems counterintuitive, right? It does seem counterintuitive. People wouldn't think that they'd be like, well, I want to go to bed earlier. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a problem. It's a problem. So then the brain learns, well, I don't have to be efficient. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's more about time than efficiency. Um, okay. So let's just go through the, you know, like if you were to optimize your sleep in a day, you'd want to be up at the same time um and you want to be getting early sunlight exposure exercising early in the morning um not napping in the afternoon um and eating you know three to four hours before you're ready to go to bed so not having these late dinners i know yeah you can you can finish eating earlier for sure for those time restricted uh intermittent fasters but just not eating later than the three hours before bed yeah right yeah so eating earlier um, avoiding high sugar, especially late at night, avoiding alcohol later at night. If you're going to drink, do it earlier in the day. Um, and then limiting light exposure, you know, around dusk, throw the blue light blocking glasses on, dim the lights around your house. 
uh, and kind of, you know, wind yourself down for bed. Don't be watching intense Netflix murder mystery shows and uh, doing, doing cognitively stimulating work. Um, we've actually put red light bulbs in our bedroom so that when we go into our bedroom, we, it's all just, you know, it's just emitting red light, which is well, always funny. Cause if somebody calls us or FaceTimes us when we're in bed, they're like, what is going on in your right, bed? Right, right, right. The, re the red lights going yeah. it's like, you, know, <laughs> you got the like, nightclub yeah, vibe going. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Except we're in bed being, you know, boring parents, but, yeah. um, do you recommend supplements? I know a lot of people like to supplement with melatonin. Do you recommend that? Or do you like to try and do it without it first? Um, what's your, what's yeah. Your... So, so melatonin is a, is a, I find a complicated topic. Um, and so, you know, I usually recommend let's work on all of those lifestyle factors first because they're so important, uh, and can also do a lot. Um, when it comes to melatonin, um, so you want to start with something that's of high quality. So you want to know your supplements and many are not. Um, so you want to work with your friendly neighborhood, you know, whether it's a naturopath or someone who knows, and then realistically where melatonin has been most shown to help is really in setting your clock of when to go to sleep. So, so the jet lag effect and taking a low dose, less than one milligram at about three to five hours before your desired bedtime is where you would naturally be getting that rise in melatonin. So you're trying to replicate that physiologic uh, effect. But the reality is you can do that. And if you're still on your bright lights and eating and doing all those other things without changing your lifestyle, you're not going to feel the difference. Um, I don't don't necessarily recommend higher doses for from a sleep perspective. I mean, there's some really interesting data about how melatonin at high doses is an antioxidant and maybe protective for other things. Mm. Um, but uh, certainly from a sleep perspective, it can give you uh, nightmares or very vivid dreams. People mm. don't necessarily feel well uh, after doing so. So I think with so many of these things, whether it's a medication or a supplement, you do have to try things for yourself and see how you react because your response is not going to be your neighbor's response but you 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 need to use good products ideally use it in a physiological low low dose several hours before bedtime to get you to fall asleep and that might help if you're doing everything else right is there issues with dependency people get worried that they're going to have to continue taking it once they've started I've truly never seen that. Um, I don't think anybody has, to be honest, such a, a significant response to it that they end up using it very long term. Um, but there's nothing addictive about it. It unlike certain, uh, it, you don't see rebound insomnia or anything like that the way you do with some medications. Right, but taking it exogenously is not going to reduce your body's own supply. Own. So, so I have not seen any, any data to suggest that. Right. Okay, that's yeah. good. Any other supplements that you that you use? for sleep in any way so some some common ones that will not make or break will not take an insomniac and make them sleep again you know magnesium is very helpful magnesium glycinate glycinate um you know there's certain things that if if stress is a big component um then if you can tolerate it things like l-threonine sometimes 5-htp is helpful there's some brands that will combine things some people find phosphatidylserine helpful some find gaba helpful you know there certainly isn't one go-to and this is again true for supplements and and medications that seems to work for everybody um so for people who want to try some of those things there's certainly welcome to again I, I would suggest getting good products and working with a practitioner around that do you do you recommend sleep tracking devices um um you know or a ring um or anything anything else i think uh, you know the 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 people who don't already have an interest and in ask me about it i'm not going to suggest it necessarily the people who ask i say look you get to find out for yourself as you did what is the impact you figure like what's a couple of drinks that what uh, alcoholic drinks what's a little bit of cracker at night what's a little bit of this and that and you get to find out you get to find exactly how it impacts you and so if you're the kind of person who finds that information valuable and will do something with it then i would say by all means it's it's worth the money mm -hmm. um and and it is you know these things are best for tracking changes in your responses so they don't necessarily correlate spectacularly well with um the findings of a, of a 
true in clinic sleep study in terms of what phases of sleep and how much REM you're in and so forth. But they can they, they can they can allow you to see changes from your baseline based on interventions that you take. So if you are in that biohacking mode and you want to see what that's what that's doing, then it's a great idea. So, it's, you know, in some cases, a continuous glucose monitor, if you really want to take it to the next level. Um, but something like an or ring can at least tell you what are the things that I'm doing and how is it impacting uh, my sleep? And, and if you want to use it, do it. Yeah, yeah, I've had it for two years, um, and so it's really interesting to see the data on it. Um, and like I said, I mean, it's not perfect. There'll be some nights where it'll say that I was awake, but it, I wasn't, and I know for a fact I wasn't. But it'll, you know, my ring is twisted or something like that. It spins around your finger, so you get, start getting a weird read. But for the most part, I find that it's really, really accurate, and I'm amazed at how how well it knows. Like it, it picked up two two nights before I developed symptoms of COVID. It picked it up. My body temperature elevated. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then the next day, my father-in-law said that he was having cold symptoms and tested positive. And then two days later we tested positive. So, but my body temperature started elevating prior to that. So you already knew that you were like, oh, it's coming. I just haven't started showing the symptoms. So really, really interesting, fascinating stuff. Um, you know, like you said, having a couple of drinks or having a late meal will completely throw off your deep sleep. And it's, it's just incredible to, to be able to play with that and, and, you know, take an interest in, in that. And you realize how, you know, crappy people are sleeping. Cause I never thought that I was, you know, bad. I always thought I'm doing everything, you know, good. I'm getting my eight hours of sleep. But when you actually start tracking, you realize like, yeah, they weren't good though, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. And it, it even allows you to, to track because of the heart rate variability and things like mm -hmm. that and heart rate, you can see where the stresses were during your day and what's actually stressing you more than, than you thought. And, and how might that be impacting you? And where do you need to fit in that relaxation practice to, to, to calm you down a bit? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, do you, do you ever use sleeping medication, um, in, in your practice? And then when do you, when do you recommend that? Because I find that's a slippery slope um, especially in a concussion population, because I feel that there's, there's, you know, side effects that come along with that. There's, you know, kind of hangover grogginess the next day, which then, you know, impacts a whole bunch of things. So when do you use it? When would you not use it? Um, and I mean, I think a lot of patients, they're desperate and there's a lot of like work that has to be done to figure this out. And so, you know, a sleeping pill is just the easiest solution oftentimes. And oftentimes the practitioners they're going to might be more willing to just throw that at them. But, you know, what are, what are some of the, um, you know, benefits, risks that people should be aware of, um, before kind of going with that option? Yeah. So, so yeah, you, you, I, I don't love the, the sleeping medications for the most part. And, and if, if, mutually myself and the patient agree that we can avoid it by by trying everything else first um, in, in combination uh, I'd much rather go there but sometimes people have been going so sleep deprived for so long they're kind of on the edge um, and uh, are feeling as you said very desperate and need something and and the reality is I think many patients whether concussion or otherwise have come back and said you know there's nights where i sleep the, the the whole night and i still feel terrible the next day and so sometimes that's actually the accomplishment and then they kind of realize okay i'm still not getting it to to where i need to be um so i i try to avoid the medications that um do have the 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 possibility of quote unquote addiction and becoming uh, developing a tolerance to it and cause rebound insomnia when they come off. And you know what we call the Z, I, I don't use benzodiazepines like Ativan and, and so forth. Um, certainly uh, not appropriate. And um, the Z drugs that are more common like Imovane and Sublinox, um, otherwise known as, as uh, Zopiclone and things like that, I don't like because they will cause uh, again, you, you can use it for a period of time, then they stop working, and then you can develop rebound insomnia or worsening insomnia when you come off it. Uh, so I don't tend to use that. Um, so some of the longer acting, non-addictive, uh, if you will, medications uh, such as mirtazapine or some trazodone is something that I will use rarely with any great benefit. And so I don't end up finding that, you know, it, it, it was okay. So we've tried that you saw what it did or didn't do for you. Um, so so now let's move on. Um, 
So uh, there's another medication that's uh, newer on the mar market called Davigo. It works in a, in a novel mechanism from these previous ones. It's sort of the same pathway that narcoleptics have. So mm. you're, you know, you're not inducing narcolepsy in the sense that people are falling asleep during the day, but you're using that same pathway. And um, I will try that. And again, it does not work for every person that I try it in. And it works, I would say, it works as well as the other ones, but with a bit of a, a better safety profile in the sense that it was tested for like months and months of continued use. There was no rebound insomnia afterwards. Um, it was tested in elderly populations. So it, it has some uh, better uh, side effect profile that I'm more comfortable with. Um, but I truly don't find, and maybe it's different, but the patient population that I'm seeing, and even within the, the, the sleep population, they're not keen to be on medications either. Oh, yeah. They, they're happy. They're happy to do anything and everything else, but, and sometimes they're like, uh, do they just need a bit of a, of a crutch, a bit of a bridge for a period of time until they get other things in order? Um, so, so I might try some Davigo. I might try some of the other ones just to see what they may or may not benefit from but everything else has to happen in, in conjunction. In your experience, what is, um, what's, what's the one kind of thing you see most consistently that people are getting wrong with respect to sleep? Um, just whether it be, you know, not getting daytime light or, um, you know, eating too late. Like, what do you see as being the most consistent thing? I would say that honestly, everybody seems to know I sh it shouldn't be on electronics at night. And the rest of it really seems new to them. Mm, right. um, so I would say that whole combination of its light, its consistency, it's about not staying in bed if you can't fall asleep, and it's about food. And um, and I say to them, okay, so I've mentioned don't eat in the three hours before bed in a little bit, but you know when when you increase the amount of fiber and vegetables in your diet, it actually has been shown to impact slow wave sleep and things like that. So the content of your diet throughout the day should also be healthier uh, and there's certain foods that actually are very inflammatory and will bother you at night so so eating cleanly and that would be a, a discussion you know for a whole other topic that i'm sure you've had with dr herkel yeah. um is is actually a very important component of of um recovery and 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 sleep so i would say pretty much everything we said up until the don't use your electronics at night was was yeah. uh, something people need to hear more about yeah, I feel that that's where people people are like, yeah, I don't even go on my phone at night. Like I, you know, I, okay, good, that's good, but nothing else, right? So I think yeah, that's... okay, you hit one of thirty. Good yeah, job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. Adit, exactly. thank you very much for joining me on this. I think this is this is informative for a lot of people, and um, you know, hopefully, this helps people to get better sleep um, after their concussion injuries, and even when not with their concussion injuries, because I think, like you said. It's basically universal. The th same things you'd recommend for anybody uh, would be the same things you recommend for uh, concussion patients. And so, um, yeah, thanks for joining me. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was my pleasure. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. All right, everybody. That is Dr. Adit Margaliot. She is a neurologist and board member for Complete Concussion Management practicing in Toronto and specializing in sleep.